Welcome to ETF Market Insights, a weekly show focusing on the evolving world of ETF investing. Each Friday, a new panel of thought leaders aims to provide investment education and insights with the goal of helping you become an informed investor. Make sure to visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights to watch previous episodes. And remember to hit subscribe so you receive a notification when we post new content and when we go live each Friday. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. Hi, I'm your host, Erin Allen with CMO ETF. Welcome to today's session on how to strengthen your core, the core of your portfolio, that is, with broad market ETFs. Uh, so we're going to be discussing what exactly we mean by broad market ETFs, which we also often refer to as core ETFs. We're going to talk about how they're built, um, the importance of well-recognized indexes in selecting a product. Um, and then lastly, we'll discuss some portfolio construction ideas on how you can actually use these to help you stay invested over the long run. Just a reminder, today we're not providing you any advice or any investment investment recommendations. Today's episode is about providing education around investing and around ETFs for investors that are really looking to take charge of their own portfolios. So with me today, I have Alfred Lee, Portfolio Manager, BMO ETF, and frequent guest on our Market Insights channel. Also, I have Paul Riccardella, who's the Executive Director at MSCI. MSCI is one of our key index partners on many of our broad market ETFs. Uh, so it's great to have you both here with me today. Before we get started, just a quick reminder, check out our YouTube channel. Here you can watch any of our past episodes that you might have missed. We have lots of great content. Please subscribe and ring the bell so that you're notified directly as soon as we uh, launch future episodes. So now for our one minute ETF update. Uh, being the beginning of the month, I thought it would be a good time to show you the flows from July. So that's what we have here from National Bank. Um, you can see here that Canadian ETFs gained 1.67 billion uh, last, might, last month. Um, and that's even despite overall outflows from equity ETFs. Um, on the fixed income side, inflows were strong at 1.74 billion. Um, and so you can see here, there's sort of a clear preference for safety over risk as investors are um, moving out of equities and, and into fixed income. Um, and lastly, commodity, multi-asset, and crypto ETFs all had inflows in July as well. So let's get into uh, broad market ETFs. Alfred, I'm going to start with you to kick us off uh, with the benefits of broad market ETFs, or as we often call them, core ETFs, um, and how they can be used to construct a portfolio. Sure. So I would say there's, you know, many different benefits of, uh, you know, core broad beta ETFs. I would say first and foremost, they're cost efficient. So when you look at something like ZCN, which is our Canadian equity ETF, that's available for five basis points. Um, something like ZSP, which is our U.S. equity ETF, uh, that's available for eight basis points. So when you compare that to, you know, traditional mutual funds, a lot more cost efficient. A lot of active mandates are available at a management fee of over 2%. So you're getting a lot of cost savings there. But in addition to that, just in terms of you know, portfolio construction, when you look at ETFs um, in the simplest form, a lot of the ETFs track you know, well-known indices, things like the S&P 500, MSCI, EFI, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of the core building blocks to your portfolio. So when it comes to portfolio construction and building a portfolio, um, compared to the old days, even 15 to 20 years ago, you know, you'd go about and building a portfolio by you know, picking individual stocks, whether it's, you know, Amazon, IBM, or whatever it may be, and, you know, slowly building up a portfolio um, security by security. The beauty of an ETF is that because every ETF is, is diversified and you're getting exposure to hundreds, if not thousands of, of securities, you're essentially focusing on the building blocks and building a portfolio more holistically. So rather than, you know, focusing on what's a better stock, you're, you're focusing more on asset allocation, which you know, we'll get into later in the discussion is more important when it comes to uh, devising a, a, a complete, you know, investment plan or, or investment portfolio. Uh, in addition to that, you know, using things like core satellite uh, methodologies, which is an institutional approach in building a portfolio, uh, dedicating a good portion of your portfolio to core beta ETFs, uh, but then tactically positioning or, you know, taking calculated risks and, and overweighting 
uh, to certain sectors or thematic ETFs um, is a good way to put together a portfolio as well. So a lot of benefits to uh, ETFs, but core ETFs make a good base to a portfolio. They're essentially the building blocks to a portfolio. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, they definitely make for a strong a strong base with their their low cost and their their inherent diversification for sure. Um, Paul, I want to bring you in here. Uh, many of our viewers are going to recognize the index providers we have here: S and P, MSCI. You know, FTSE is another really well known uh, index provider. Can you walk us through why the index that an ETF tracks matters? Of course, and and thank you for having me, Aaron. It's uh it's great to be with you again, and just for the benefit of the audience, um, I work for MSCI. My job essentially is to work with ETF investors and make sure that they are comfortable with the indexes that popular ETFs track. Because I think, to the spirit of your question, Aaron, not all indexes are created equally, and the construction approach to them matters. Um, and it's of course got ramifications for the ETF tracking. The index. So at, at a really high level, at MSCI, we believe that indexes need to be representative, investable, and replicable. And so representative means they have to actually represent the market that uh, they are seeking to capture. And so if you use Canada for an, as an example, very significant in financial services and energy, the Canadian economy. And so if you were to look at an index and those two sectors didn't have the top weights in a Canada index, it would make you question the representativeness of that index. Now, in terms of investability, this is something that doesn't come into play as much in North America, but in other parts of the world, specifically emerging markets, just because a particular company is publicly listed doesn't mean that it's actually investable. Sometimes there are controlling families, inaccessible share classes, that sort of thing. And so it's on an index provider to truly figure out what's investable and what is not. And then of course, on the replicable uh, function, it's very important that indexes have plenty of capacity, right? The worst thing you would want is for an ETF tracking a particular index to hit a limit in terms of how much money they could manage against that index. And so replicability is an important feature and you know just to give you a quick example of some of the differences perhaps in approach uh, for some index providers so there are some that are of the philosophy that a fixed number of companies in the index makes sense that is not our philosophy at MSCI we are much more of the the free float mindset where the amount of companies in your index should have some bearing on the amount of public companies in that market. And so let's just say, for example, that Canada has less public companies today than it did 25 years ago. Would 100 stocks in an index be the right amount to represent that? We would argue no, it should float with the amount of public companies. The other thing that index providers often face is determining which countries are developed, emerging, or frontier. And so there can be significant differences. And I think to, to answer your question directly, Aaron, the index providers that get this right offer a ton of value to investors because having everyone look through the same lens, have agreement on which indexes represent certain markets, have those indexes be investable, replicable, BV, basis of BMO ETFs, but also the uh, active, uh, or excuse me, the benchmarks for actively managed mutual funds and products just offers a ton of value to everyone in the ecosystem because they're looking through the same lens and you agree that it's uh, a reasonable proxy for the market. Absolutely, thanks for that, Paul. I think, you know, what we read in the news and if we're, if we're constantly getting quoted MSCI world, MSCI, EC, S&P 500, we're going to be constantly comparing our portfolios to that too. So just having that that approach that's consistent is so important. Um, can you give us an overview of MSCI? What makes you guys one of the, the leading index providers globally? 
So MSCI is a public company. We have a, a 50 year history. In addition to indexes, we have a, a risk analytics service under BARA. We are also the largest ESG research and ratings agency in the world. And then we have a, an institutional real estate business. Now, in terms of indexes, if you look back at our history and heritage, creating a set of globally diversified indexes in the late 1960s was actually a pretty radical thing at the time. Generally speaking, your average investor back then bought, let's call it 12 to 25, maybe 40, mostly large cap stocks in the company, in the country in which they reside. And so for us coming into the market, having a global mindset, creating the EFA index, which covers more than 20 countries, was really an innovative thing at the time. And that global orientation and that innovative mindset has stuck with us over the years. And we've really benefited greatly from the fact that we are physically spread out across the globe. MSCI quite literally has 30 offices in 20 something different countries across the globe, which allows us really to be experts in local markets. And we cover roughly 80 markets globally. And so I think it all stems from our history and heritage over time. And, and obviously, you know, you can see the stats on the, on the sheet here, but almost $17 trillion benchmarked to us globally. Roughly a third of that is direct index tracking assets. And in North America alone, there's uh, there's about $800 billion in ETF AUM and then much more in institutional separate accounts directly tracking our indexes. Great, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I know you guys are so much more than just these core broad market indexes that you're so well known for. You're constantly innovating and you know, coming from the product team, I know that we always turn to you guys to 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 uh, help us figure out what the the next greatest innovation would be. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about uh, dig deeper into some of these broad market indexes and look at some of the ETF solutions available. So, Paul, let's start with sort of the broadest exposure here, the MSCI EC. Uh, what exactly is this index giving you exposure to, and, and how is it constructed? So the MSCI EFA is one of the indexes that the company was founded on 50 years ago. So it is a developed markets index. And I just want to make sure I'm clear in the definitions there. So developed markets have advanced economies, financial systems, generally higher uh, GDP per capita than other places in the world. So think North America, Australia, New Zealand, Europe etc. And so this particular index uh, is developed markets ex North America. So no exposure to the US or Canada. It currently has 802 stocks in it from 21 different countries across the globe. And I think the other thing I wanted to make sure to point out, because it's relevant to the products that you offer, is that this index has a significant weight in non-Canadian dollar currency. So for example, that 22.5% weight that you can see in Japan, which is the largest country weight, those assets are denominated in yen. And so for any Canadian investor that's invested in this index, you have both the stock performance, how are the stocks in Japan doing, and then you have the currency aspect as well. How is the Canadian dollar doing relative to the Japanese yen? And so this index essentially makes up about 25% of the total stock value globally in the world. Roughly 60% of it is US oriented, about 5% in Canada, 25% here, and then the, uh, the remainder in emerging markets. Great, thank you. And we're going to, Alfred, I'm going to ask you to get into the, the actual products that can get you exposure to this index. Um, and just to note that another another benefit of, of these 
broad market ETFs is that you can see 100% of the holdings in them at any given time on our website. So I wanted to put that up, but I didn't have room on the slide, but just, just know that if you go to our website under the holdings tab, you can see all of the companies that they hold at any given time. Um, Alfred, do you want to walk us through some of the ETF options available to, to get exposure here? Sure, yeah. So we do have um, two ETFs available, both tracking the MSCI EFI index. Um, so as Paul mentioned, you know, I would say the MSCI EFI index is the most widely recognized international developed uh, equity market indice out there. Uh, institutions use it, uh, retail advisors are benchmarked to it. Um, so we do have ETFs that track uh, that specific index. So we have two versions available to uh, Canadian investors, ZDM, which is the hedged back to the Canadian dollar version, and ZEA, which is the unhedged version. So um, as Paul mentioned, you know, there's anytime you make an investment internationally or outside of Canada, you're essentially getting two streams of return. You're getting the returns of the underlying securities, but then you're getting the returns of the underlying currency as well. So ZDM, what we're doing in this one is that we are hedging out the currencies. So we're basically eliminating the noise of the currency. So all you're left with is essentially the movement of the stocks. ZEA, however, for Canadian investors, you're going to get not only the exposure to the stocks, but the underlying currencies as well. So because we're invested in Japan, the UK, uh, Europe, uh, Australia, you're getting the underlying exposure of those currencies in ZEA as well. Perfect, thanks, Alfred. Um, and then let's let's go on to the next MSCI index, Paul, if you will, uh, the MSCI Emerging Market Index. Can you walk us through uh, the construction and methodology behind behind that? So um, emerging markets, that term and concept was something that initially surfaced in the mid '80s, um, and the first MSCI Emerging Markets Index traces back to the end of 1987. We were the first index provider to get to this uh, space. And as the, the name implies, these are markets and countries uh, that are rising, that are becoming more globalized, but aren't quite yet at developed markets status. So this particular index has about 1,400 stocks in it. It covers 24 emerging markets countries inclusive of all of them the um you know the one current event is you you may remember uh a few months ago when russia first invaded uh ukraine that russia pretty quickly became uninvestable citizens outside of russia were not able to transact in their market and so that particular country was stripped out of the MSCI Emerging Markets Indexes, as well as all other Emerging Markets Indexes globally. And so this, these indexes, their methodology is very fluid. I mentioned it at the outset that you know representative, investable, and replicable are the things that we really focus on. And I would you know, say one of the added benefits of MSCI is that our methodology is the same across the board, right? Our, EM indexes are similar to the EFA methodology, which is similar to MSCI USA and MSCI Canada. We don't have a different approach depending on where you are in the world. And that is actually a difference from other index providers who generally have one approach in their home market or in North America and then a different approach elsewhere. And so the consistency of our um, indexing approach, the fact that there are no gaps, no overlaps, and we cover the globe is something we believe is unique to MSCI in this particular index, as I said, represents 24 countries globally, 1,400 stocks, and about 10% of uh, the total equity market cap in the world. Great, thanks, Paul. And our, our emerging markets, ETF ZEM is the largest in Canada, but Alfred, do you want to walk us through um, that solution as well? Maybe you can touch on the, why we're still showing a Russia exposure there as well. Yeah, so for these ones, um, uh, we are showing a Russia just because they, are, they have been written down to, to zero. So we, uh, they essentially exited the, the portfolio um, at essentially no value, um, but uh, we still hold them in the portfolio um, just because those market are, as Paul mentioned, uninvestable at this time. Um, so the portfolios 
for those positions, which were minimal at the time, uh, are essentially, you know, again, written down to zero. But we do, for ZEM, what, what I would point out is we only have one option for this. We don't have a currency hedge uh, version. Uh, reason being is that because hedging the emerging market currencies tends to be very cost prohibitive. Um, also, in addition to that, a lot of the currencies, so things like India um, and China, um, there's no forwards or there's no way of shorting the currency as well. So because of that, uh, there's only one uh, version of this, which is the non-hedge version. So there's, uh, when you look globally, there is not a currency hedge version of emerging market uh, equity ETFs, just because it tends to be, as I mentioned, very cost prohibitive in, in terms of hedging a lot of those emerging market currencies. Great. And here we're just showing um, ZEM versus the Vanguard EM uh, ETF. And I thought this was interesting because Vanguard doesn't track the MSCI EM index. Um, and it just shows you if you look at a comparison of the two over different periods, you will see uh, periods where there's quite a bit of difference in returns. So that's something to be aware of. Again, you know, why we talked about why you want to go with the well recognized indexes and um, just something to consider there as well. If I can just chime in on one last thing there, you know, I, I mentioned it at the outset, but a big part of what an index provider does is assess if each market country is developed, emerging, or frontier. And there are differences in, uh, in views. And obviously, us and FTSE, who is the basis of the Vanguard ETF, um, have different views on some of those countries. And so, for example, South Korea, they consider to be developed, we consider to be emerging. I think the key point is that we are assessing the market, not necessarily the country. And in the case of South Korea, their, uh, their currency convertibility is just incredibly poor. It is much more on par with an emerging market than a, a developed market, but some of those decisions are quite key in coming up with the uh the end index and uh it's something that we spend a lot of uh, a lot of time and effort on great point yes thank you for for highlighting the korea point there um okay let's move on to the s p 500 alfred uh obviously one of the most well-known indexes in the world uh what's this index giving you exposure to and and what are some etfs that that track it yeah, so as you mentioned, the S&P 500, I would say, is the most widely recognized uh, U.S. equity index out there. Um, institution or institutional clients use it, um, our retail clients use it as well. Uh, but for this one, you know, what we want to do is just give many different options, uh, very similar to what we did with uh, ZEA and ZDM. So we have three different formats, a ZUE, which is the hedged um, back to the Canadian dollar version. So this one essentially strips out the currency volatility so you just get exposure to the underlying securities uh, zsp is the unhedged version so for this one you get the underlying uh, returns of the securities and in addition to uh, the performance of the us dollar versus the canadian dollar as well and last but not least we have zsp.u so dot u is essentially a us dollar version but trading on the tsx or trading on the canadian exchanges uh, this one's very important because for those investors um, that are concerned about things like estate taxes, uh, because ZSP is registered as a Canadian mutual fund trust, uh, it is exempt from uh, estate taxes given that it's not considered U.S. property. Um, also, you know, for any upcoming kind of potential regulatory changes as well, uh, ZSP, again, because it is considered a Canadian mutual fund trust, arguably would be better protected for them. Um, uh, any regulatory changes that may come as well. Great point. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's let's look at uh, our last exposure here that I just wanted to highlight uh, for Canada, the S and P TSX cap composite. Alfred, what's this what's this giving exposure to, and and what are uh, the ETFs that track it? So this is essentially you know the index that you know most widely used for Canadian equities, uh, the S and P TSX, which is you know uh, quoted on in your uh, news and, and whatnot. Um, so this is, you know, provides exposure to large cap Canadian equities, um, but essentially, uh, you know, available at five basis points. So as I mentioned before, when you compare this to active mandates such as mutual funds, a lot more cost efficient than traditional uh, mutual funds. 
Awesome, thank you. Now, uh, Alfred, I just wanted to touch on the performance of these broad market ETFs. Um, can you walk us through what this slide is showing in terms of, of their performance relative to sort of the broad Morningstar categories? Sure, so this is basically a chart that highlights the ranges of returns from active managers, and then what you'll find is that this compares the return of the index or the ETF that tracks the index versus the Morningstar uh, universe. So what you'll find over here is that uh, the ETFs or the passive exposures generally perform very well uh, compared to the active manager. So as we all know, and from empirical evidence, uh, it's very tough for active managers to consistently beat the benchmark over the long term. That's right, yes. And just a note on, on these, the returns that we used to to develop this graphic were wind threads to, re, to remove sort of the top 10% top and bottom 10%, which just helps to remove those extreme outlying data points. Um, but this is a, a great picture, I think. Um, now, it's, it's definitely very difficult to, to time the market. And I like this chart because I think it gives a good uh, overview of the different asset classes that are performing in each year and you can see that it you know it varies over time so really uh, we do suggest taking a diversified approach to investing in these, these these core etfs instead of putting all your eggs in one basket but i just really like this graphic here um alfred i i wanted you to walk us through um the benefits of staying invested we like to drive this home in a lot of our our ETF market insights, it's so important. And I think these core ETFs can definitely help. But walk, walk us through what this, what this chart shows, because I think it's very powerful. Sure, I think this is very topical right now as well, as you know, more and more people are hearing about um, the R word recession. So a lot of investors are trying to time the market at this point, just moving out of the markets and into cash, and then waiting for you know, the volatility to abate a little bit, and then potentially down the road, reinvesting into the equity market. So you know, as you mentioned, I think this is a good illustration in terms of how timing the market can be very difficult. Uh, so what we did here was we compared two hypothetical portfolios. Uh, portfolio A, which remained invested in the S&P TSX throughout time. Um, so beginning in January 1st of 2007 up until June 20th of 2022. And the second portfolio, Portfolio B, is where an investor tried to time the market. So they removed um, their investment or they moved into cash for two months only between um, March and May of 2009. And just those two months alone, just moving into cash for those two months alone made a huge difference in terms of, of the total returns of those two portfolios. So portfolio A, the total return was you know, 133%, whereas trying to time the market made a huge difference. The total return was 79.4% um, over that time span. So, you know, Portfolio B still had a pretty impressive return, but when you look at the difference in the in the dollar value, uh, $55,000 essentially, which is a pretty huge increment or a pretty huge difference when you're uh, considering that it was only a $100,000 investment. So I think, as you mentioned, I think this illustration is very good. Um, really highlights you know the importance of staying invested and not trying to get uh, too cute and try to time the market yeah timing timing the market is hard and a lot of us don't get it right so uh, and you can see here just how hard it is to catch up uh, if you do make uh, the wrong move there um, walk us through this asset allocation is the primary driver of performance not timing the market walk us through this study um, Alfred please yeah, so this is um, something I learned early in my career. So I started my career in the institutional consultant side of the business. And this is one study that we often refer to. Um, there was a number of different studies that basically looked at, you know, what are the main con con uh, contributions when it comes to building a portfolio? Is it asset allocation, which is the decision of, you know, allocating to things like Canadian equities, U.S. equities, bonds, emerging market equities, and so on? Or is it security selection? So is it picking... You know, Royal Bank over TD, or is it um, considering you know overweighting um, technology versus financials, um, or is it market timing? So there's been a number of different studies. Uh, the Brinson B. Bauer one tends to be the most widely recognized. Uh, there was a number of other follow-up studies that um, debated the amount that uh, was 
you know, basically contributed to uh, the various three different decisions. But overall, the final, you know, all of them uh, basically came to the same conclusion, which was asset allocation was the most important decision when it comes to putting together a portfolio. So we could all debate in terms of, you know, what uh, the exact amounts are, but without a doubt, I think asset allocation is uh, for sure uh, the most important decision that comes uh, that you have to make when it comes to uh, putting together a portfolio. So I urge any of one of our viewers to definitely check out that study as I think it's very important when it comes to putting together your investment plan or uh, portfolio. Awesome. Thanks, Alfred. Now, if you're just getting started in investing, you don't know where to begin when it comes to your asset mix or your asset allocation, or how to use these broad-based, broad-market ETFs, what percentage you should be allocating to each, what is a great tool for investors to use, Alfred? I think these asset allocation ETFs are um, a good way for those investors. I mean, there's a lot of investors, even in, even not just for investors that are just starting off, but for investors that simply don't have the time or the know-how in, in putting together a portfolio, these are a good solution. So these are asset allocation ETFs that basically are based on uh, four different risk profiles. What you get is one ETF that holds many different ETFs in them. So you only pay one fee, which is the top fee. Um, so we have four different asset allocation ETFs, again, based on various risk profiles. We have uh, Zcon, which is the most conservative. There is 60% uh, in uh, fixed income and then 40% in equities. Uh, keep in mind, you know, when you consider the fixed income and equities, there's many different ETFs within those two different asset classes. Uh, next up, we have the balanced ETF, ZBAL, which is the traditional or prototypical 60-40 portfolio, which is 60% in equities and 40% fixed income. And then further up the risk spectrum, we have ZGROW, which is a little bit more aggressive, 80% in equities, 20% in fixed income. And then we recently launched, I think a year ago, our all equity ETF, which is 100% in equities. But again, uh, even when you look at uh, within the equities and fixed income exposure, there's many different ETFs that represent those different asset allocations or those various assets. Awesome. Yeah. And really sort of two ways you can you can use these. We don't usually promote putting all your eggs in one basket, but with these, they're so diversified in the asset mixes. They're so fine-tuned to the different risk profiles that you can just simply buy an asset allocation ETF and, and nothing else. Or you can use this, as you mentioned, as the core of your portfolio and build your satellite positions around it, whether you want to tilt to a specific sector or a specific theme, um, another great way to use these. All right, well, that caps off our discussion on broad market ETFs. I do want to switch and talk about a couple of our audience's questions that we got this week. Um, keep submitting them, we love to get them. Um, Alfred, I'm gonna turn this first one over to you. Can you please provide an update on the results of earnings seasons thus far? What are the implications for investors? So it's been, it's been pretty mixed so far. Um, so far, you know, earnings have been uh, all over the board. Some have uh, surprised to the upside. For for example, Texas Instruments uh, essentially, you know, beat the earnings by quite a bit, uh, where you had other companies like Microsoft, which is disappointed. So it's been very mixed. Uh, we've had some companies, especially in the tech space, kind of revise their earnings downwards. But the good news to investors is that most of that bad news seems to be already priced into the market. So even though we've had very mixed results um, over the last couple of uh, days or or even last two weeks, it seems like the market has essentially shook off all the bad news and essentially seems like it's it's in, in an upward, um, essentially looks like it wants to rally at this point. Great, thanks for that. Okay, the next question, can you please discuss the composition of ZESG? What are the criteria for companies being included and are the companies that are included global or just North American? Um, so ZESG is one of our asset allocation ETFs. We didn't have room on the previous slide to, to put them, but this is our ESG balance uh, ETF, and it's a 60-40 asset mix. It is global, so not just North American. Um, and the difference is that it's built, instead of using our core broad, broad market ETFs that we talked about a lot about in this session, 
It's built off of our ESG ETF. And I'm glad Paul is here because I, I think I can turn it over to him in terms of what are the criteria for companies being included. So maybe you can walk us through a brief overview of how the ESG leaders indexes actually work to, to invest in the, the top rated ESG securities. Happy to, Aaron. Um, so as you mentioned, the, the ESG leaders index is the methodology here. And as the name implies, it is seeking companies that are more sustainable, that have environmental, social, and governance risks managed better relative to their peer group. So the ESG rating that MSCI produces is a triple A to triple C score. And it's very important to note that the rating is centric to its industry, meaning that we wouldn't compare BMO's ESG profile to the ESG profile of an oil and gas exploration company in Canada, right? It makes no sense. BMO has different ESG issues being a financial services organization, a business built on trust than an oil and gas exploration company where, where it is much more about environmental impact. And so at a high level, the score is triple A to triple C. Accompanying that score is what we call a controversy score, which is a zero to 10 quantitative measure that assesses how much controversy a particular company is involved in with zero being the worst. And so the way these indexes work is that we strip out a handful of companies from the universe initially. And so if we're talking about MSCI Canada, for example, is a starting point. The ESG leaders version of Canada is one of the holdings in, uh, in this fund of ETFs. We would strip out certain common things that ESG investors tend to find objectionable. Tobacco, um, weapons, um, nuclear weapons specifically, things like that. There are specifically um, seven exclusion categories. After we strip all of those obvious objectionable uh, business activities out, we then screen out for any company that has a really poor ESG rating. So uh, double B in this particular index is the minimum rating. After we screen out for that minimum rating, we then get rid of companies involved in severe controversies, zeros, ones, and twos in this particular case. And so after you use those three different exclusionary metrics, you are left with the universe. And essentially what we do is create an index that is sector neutral, right? So there's 11 sectors out there, financial services, technology, consumer staples, et cetera. We create an index that's sector neutral and we simply start with all of the triple A's according to their ESG rating. And then we move to the double A's and then the single A's and we keep filling it in until 50% of the market cap is covered from the starting index. So again, if you use MSCI Canada as an example, the starting index is roughly 90 stocks, you would expect the ESG leaders version of that index to have somewhere in the vicinity of 45 stocks based on that 50% market cap coverage target. And you would expect the sector weights in MSCI Canada and MSCI Canada ESG leaders to be exactly the same. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Um, now, that caps off another great week of ETF Market Insights. Thanks to Alfred and Paul for joining me. Thank you to everybody who tuned in this week. Remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel to get easy access to a wealth of different resources on all things ETF. Next Friday, we'll be back and we will be discussing investing in infrastructure. I'm going to be joined by Vish from our portfolio management team and Joseph from Brookfield. Uh, so really excited to dig into how infrastructure um, as sort of an alternative asset class is really well positioned right now as a defensive exposure in these times of inflation and uh, economic downturn. Um, so I hope you can join us then. Uh, we'll see you then. Bye for now. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, 
please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at ETFMarketInsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.